uh, unmuted now. Hello and welcome uh, to today's uh, event. The event today is hosted by the Hellenic Observatory and the National Bank of Greece and is part of the Hellenic Observatory's annual Athens Lecture Series, which is supported by the LSE Hellenic Alumni Association. The event is also part of the LSE Shaping the Post-COVID World Initiative, a series of events imagining what the world could look like after the crisis and how we can get there. Our event today is titled Minimum Wages, Lessons from the International Experience. Uh, as many of you will already know, in recent years, many countries have looked to increase minimum wages as part of a strategy to address labor market problems, including in-work poverty and low pay, but also more wide uh, problems. Just yesterday, the European Council agreed to uh, take forward the negotiations for the EU law on adequate minimum wages across the EU, accepting the Council recommendation uh, proposal of 2020, and also the Parliament signed in uh, approved that uh, as well. The lecture will, um, I don't think it will engage too much with the current European Union policy making, but it will uh, talk about the developments in relation to the international experience, what uh, has been the, the impact of minimum wages on the international experience and what minimum wage policy should look like uh, in the future. Uh, our keynote speaker is perhaps the most qualified person to speak uh, on the topic, Professor Alan Manning. He's Professor of Economics in the Department of Economics of the LSE and Director of the Com Community Program at the Center for Economic uh, Performance. Alan is one of the most uh, highly cited and well-published uh, labor economists uh, uh, in the world. Uh, he is most widely, I think, known for his work on the minimum wages and on imperfect labor markets, but he has made important contributions on a range of topics in labor economics, from employment polarization, gender pay gaps, to unemployment and, and wage bargaining. And more recently, his work on immigration, culture, and identity. His publications include his uh, 2003 book, Mon Option in Motion, in Motion, with Princeton University Press, and papers in uh, pretty much uh, all top journals in economics, the Economic Journal, American Economic Review, Review of Economic Statistics, Journal of Labor Economics, and many others. Uh, Alan is fellow of the Society of Labor Economists and of the European Economic Association. And he has served until very recently, I believe, as chair of the UK's uh, Migration Advisory uh, Committee. Uh, he's also held many editorial positions in senior economics uh, journals and has uh, public service uh, more widely, including in the issue of minimum wages, on which he's going to talk to us today. Now, to, to discuss uh, uh, past his presentation, we have two um, very eminent uh, Greek uh, academics. Uh, to, to talk and perhaps link the, the, the topic closer to, uh, to Greece. Uh, our first discussion will be Manolis Kalinianos, who is Professor of Economics at Royal Holloway at the University of London. Uh, prior to uh, coming to Royal Holloway, uh, Manolis was Assistant Professor of Economics at Pennsylvania State University and Visiting Assistant Professor at the New York University and at Yale. His research focuses on macroeconomics, applied theory, and labor economics, and he, was, he recently became member of the Independent Experts Committee on the Minimum Wage. Uh, in Greece. Our second uh, discussion is Professor Adivoni Liberaki. Uh, Professor Liberaki is an economist, Professor of Economics at Pandium University uh, in Athens. Uh, she uh, was educated at the Athens University and the Institute of Development Studies at Sussex. Uh, she has also taught at City University of New York uh, and the Col de Hotel et Tudes, sorry, my friends are not very good, and Science Sociales in Paris, in France. Uh, her research interests have focused on the interplay between social structures and economic performance. She has published uh, widely both on, on labor issues, but also on gender uh, and wider social issues. And uh, she has participated in civil society, society initiatives related to women's rights, migration, and development. Uh, now, before I pass the, the floor to our speakers, I would like to make just a couple of uh, organizational announcements. Um, uh, for those Twitter users in the audience, the hashtag for today's event is hashtag LSC post COVID. The event will be uh, uh, recorded, is being recorded, and will hopefully be made available as a podcast subject to no technical uh, difficulties, of course. Um, as usual, there will be a chance for the audience to put on uh, to put uh, the questions. Submit your questions, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Questions will be submitted uh, to myself, and then I will pose as many of the questions as possible to our speakers. For those watching the event live on Facebook, Please, you can add your, your questions as comments and we'll pick them up uh, from there. Please, if you can, mention your affiliation and where you're watching from uh, when you type in uh, your question. So uh, that was all the introductory. Without further ado, I will pass the floor to Alan Manning for his presentation. Alan. 
Thank you very much, um, Vasilis, uh, for that very kind um, introduction. And, and thank you for the invitation, the opportunity to, to speak um, to you today. I'll just share my um, slides. Um, okay, um, let's have a look. Okay, hopefully everyone can, um, can see that. Um, okay, so um, the overview of the um, talk today is that I'm going to talk about um, the experience of um, sort of OECD countries, high income countries uh, with the minimum wage. I'm going to pay particular attention actually to uh, the UK, probably for the bad reason that that's the country that I know best, but I think there's also a good reason, which is that actually uh, what it's been doing with the minimum wage in recent years has actually been uh, one of the more interesting countries. I'm going to talk about the impact, the evidence about the impact of the minimum wage on employment, wage inequality and poverty. And at the end, I'm going to um, talk a bit about what we might learn from this um, for Greece. Um, but I have a bit of a question mark there because um, the discussions are really Greek experts much more than me, um, but you know I will outline the sort of things that I think uh, one should be looking at. Okay, so we're currently in a period when minimum wages um, are currently um, in, in fashion. Um, so they're not only very common across countries, but they're spreading. So for example, in 1998, out of 30 OECD countries, only 17 um, of them had a minimum wage. By 2015, the OECD got a bit bigger, but 26 out of 34 countries um, had one. We've seen countries like Germany introduce a, a minimum wage in 2015. And it's not just countries who didn't have minimum wages introducing them. It's also some countries um, you know, who have had minimum wages for a very long time um, raising them. So in the US, although the federal minimum uh, remain, has remained at the same level for a decade. Uh, there have been a lot of increases in, in, um, state, in many states, in many cities. And so, you know, there's sort of the fight for 15 would be the mobilizing cry uh, for that. Uh, and the UK has, you know, a target for the minimum wage um, to be, the adult minimum wage, to be two thirds of median hourly um, earnings by 2020, uh, 2024. And, you know, if you ask where does that upward pressure come from, I think they're really two, two sources. The first is sort of changes in professional opinion about the impact of minimum wages. And, and secondly, um, it's as a, partly a political response to inequality and stagnating or even falling uh, uh, living standards. Um, and, you know, there's a feeling that if we can't make our economic system uh, work for most people, we can't reasonably expect people to continue to uh, lend the current system its sort of political, their political support. So I'll talk a bit about both of, of these things. So, um, so just to illustrate the changes in professional opinion, um, you know, if we go back to sort of 1994, the OECD did this big study of um, that they called the job study. And basically, you know, what it said about minimum wage at, at that point was, if it is judged desirable to maintain a legal minimum wage as part of an anti-poverty strategy, consider minimizing its adverse employment effects. So I think, you know, reading between the lines, that sort of saying, we'd really rather you didn't have a minimum wage, but if you have to, don't have it very high. Um, by 2018, the sort of update to it, the so-called job strategy, um, you know, was sort of much more positive about it, that minimum uh, wages can help ensure that work is rewarding for everyone, and that when minimum wages are moderate and well-designed, adverse employment effects can be, can be avoided. And those two quotes, I think, summarise the way in which um, professional opinion has, has changed. And you can see that in, for example, um, surveys of, of academic opinion, this is a survey of sort of members of the American Economic Association asked whether they agree whether the minimum wage uh, increases unemployment among young and unskilled workers. If we work back to 1976, only 10% of economists uh, disagreed with that. 68% um, agreed without any provisions. Uh, by the time we get to 2011, we have 25% disagree. 
and only 39% um, agreeing. But you can see that even in 2011, um, this, the minimum wage remains a, a controversial topic. It's a controversial topic in the UK. I'm sure it's a controversial topic in Greece as, um, as well. Um, so, you know, why have professional opinion changed in this way? Um, and I think there are a couple of reasons. One is that there's a sort of a change in the view about how well unregulated labour markets uh, work. Um, and so I think, you know, 25 years ago, most labour economists really sort of assumed that wages would equilibrate demand and supply. Um, if you didn't, if the government didn't intervene and any raise in the rise in the minimum wage would sort of simply interfere with a well working market and cause a fall in labour demand and, and result in job losses. Whereas I think now more economists are open to the idea that um, employers have some influence over wages that we wouldn't expect uh, wages, uh, labour markets to work quite as smoothly as that idealised model. And you may be able to actually raise minimum wages uh, without, um, without harming employment. So there's a sort of theoretical um, side to the sort of the view that economists, labour economists have over labour markets. But I think more importantly was, um, you know, there was the empirical evidence. And this, you know, started with the work of David Card and Alan Kruger in the in the United States in the early 1990s. And, you know, they sort of in a, they sort of reviewed um, existing um, evidence on the impact of the minimum wage. They came up with creative new ways of of, find, of, of evidence and they failed to find evidence that minimum wage had caused the job loss that was predicted by so many um, uh, so many economists. And, you know, this year that work was sort of rewarded. David Card got half the, the Nobel Prize in economics and a big part of that award was really for, uh, for his work on that. And Alan Kruger um, sadly passed away a few years ago, but um, he would likely have, have shared in that if he'd still been with us uh, today. So that's why people are becoming uh, more enthusiastic about things. But, uh, you know, a word of caution, I don't think there are any economists who think that at some level a minimum wage could uh, cause job losses. Um, that, you know, you can't raise the minimum wage forever and ever and ever without eventually that causing some problems. Um, but how high, you know, the question is really how high can the minimum wage be raised before it causes job losses? Um, and, you know, if we look around and we try to answer that kind of question, one natural source of evidence is um, international experience. And so a number of countries have raised minimum wages in recent years, and then they've sort of carefully examined what happens to employment. And I think that has lessons not just for those countries, but more, more widely. And the, the UK is a particularly good um, example of, of, of that. So a very brief history of minimum wages in the, in the UK. So actually, it was probably uh, one of the most famous Britons in, who established the first minimum wages in the UK. It was Winston Churchill in 1909, when he set up what were called the wages councils to set minimum wages in certain industries. That system lasted till 1992. It was a very complicated system. And by 1992, it was a very archaic system. And so in 1993, the then Conservative government in the UK uh, abolished the wages councils and the UK was left without any minimum wage whatsoever except in agriculture which is sort of um, something under two percent of total employment. Now when Tony Blair won the election in uh, 1997 he won it on a manifest had a manifesto commitment to introduce a national minimum wage and that is what has ha happened. So in 1999 uh, you know, the national minimum wage was introduced. This was extremely controversial at the time. It was opposed by the Conservative Party, um, both in the 1997 election and um, at the subsequent election in, in 2001. But now this has, you know, changed a lot because I think everybody looking back at this now says, well, this was a good policy. This was a really good policy. Um, there are still disagreements about what level the minimum wage should be at, but there isn't really any sizable constituency now in the UK saying we shouldn't have a minimum wage at all. And, and central, I think, to establishing that sort of legitimacy was, um, you know, that the Blair government set up an independent low pay commission 
um, which consists basically of three uh, representatives from unions. They're not formal delegates, but they sort of normally have a union background, three employer, people with an employer background, and three independents who are normally academic uh, labor economists. And those look at the evidence and they make recommendations about the level of the minimum wage, the government uh, based on the evidence. And then the government decides whether or not to accept those recommendations. I mean, most of the time it has, but there have been some occasions uh, when, when it hasn't. And I think that institutional setup has been very important in um, establishing uh, the minimum wage uh, in, in the UK. Now, if we look at what has happened to the minimum wage um, in the UK, we, um, a natural, I think a good measure to look at is the minimum wage as a percentage of median, um, you know, earnings. This is a median, median earnings of full-time workers, um, actually, which is the way the OECD uh, computes it. Median earnings being, you know, what a measure of what the average person earns. Uh, and what you can sort of see is that there was, it was introduced, it was a bit over 40% of median earnings, but there was a period when the low pay commission had a bit of a look around, look to see what was happening. It didn't really push things forward. Then in the early 2000, you know, sort of in the early 2000s, it had a look, it hadn't seen any evidence of job losses. It started pushing it up a bit further. It then around the economic crisis, the financial crisis got a bit nervous about pushing it up further. So again, there was a sort of slight pause. And then we see this big change in 2016, which I'll come back to um, in, in a minute. And then this really quite sharp rise um, after, uh, after that. Um, now, in terms of what the impacts of this have been, it's had a very dramatic impact on inequality, wage inequality in the bottom part of the wage distribution. So although we generally think of inequality um, in many countries as being higher now than it used to be, if you look at the bottom half of the UK wage distribution, that is not the true. true. In fact, the level of inequality in the bottom part of the UK wage distribution is at now at a 50 year low, maybe even further back. We don't have any statistics um, further back than that. And the minimum wage has played a huge role in, in doing that. Um, and it's been able to do that without any uh, clear impact on, on employment. <coughs> so this is the percentage of working age population in employment. Um, I finished just before the pandemic, which has rather messed everything up. But you can see that prior to the pandemic, basically we were at a 30 year high in, uh, in, in the employment population uh, ratio. Um, now, when the Low Pay Commission looks at evidence, they look at it in a bit more detail than this, but this gives you the, you know, the big picture um, of, of what's been happening. The UK pre-pandemic had very low, lowest wage inequality for 50 years at the bottom and the highest employment to population ratio. Um, but, you know, so the minimum wage has clearly benefited workers at the bottom of the wage distribution. But one problem that became apparent is that it didn't have a more wider effect on wage inequality. So if we look, for example, at this sort of blue line here, which is the fraction of people with hourly pay below two thirds of the minimum, you can see that after the minimum wage is introduced in the late 1990s, the minimum wage didn't have any um, impact on the fraction of people on this def definition of low pay. And the reason for that was the minimum wage was not set anywhere near two thirds of median earnings. It was set at something like 45% of median earnings. So it just, the impact just didn't reach far enough up the wage distribution. But the UK had a problem with living standards more generally. And so it thought about doing a change. And what you notice is that after about you know, 2015, this proportion actually um, falls a lot. Um, and the reason for that is a policy change that came in in 2016. And that policy is given a name, the national living wage, but basically it's just a higher minimum wage initially for those people aged 25 or more, but currently applies to those aged 23 or more. And in 2016, the finance minister or the chancellor, as we call them, um, surprised everyone in his budget speech by announcing the national li living wage. Um, and a target for it to be sort of two thirds of earnings, sorry, that should say two thirds of earnings by 2024. Um, and, you know, that it is that policy which has been responsible for the bigger impacts um, on inequality we've seen since 2016. And so far, uh, we've seen very little evidence of 
adverse employment effects from that uh, changes from, from that change. So, um, you know, the low pay commission is consider continuing to say, well, keep on track for this 2024 uh, art, um, 2024 target. And if that's reached, the UK will actually end up with one of um, the higher minimum wages um, in, in the OECD. Um, now, you know, that's a, that's a little bit surprising because it's a conservative government that's done all of uh, all of this. Um, but um, there are some issues with the national living wage um, that I think it's important kind of talking about. First of all, the government made its decision to introduce it without the recommendation of its expert committee. Um, and, um, you know, it has the right to do that, but a lot of people felt it was too uh, political a decision uh, when this independent expert committee had, had played such an um, important role previously. Um, the second kind of issue is that um, the minimum wage has its limitations as an anti-poverty tool, I'll talk about that. And as the minimum wage has, has risen, I think there have started to be um, other issues that are, have kind of began to emerge as potentially uh, important. So enforcement of the minimum wage has become more of an issue. The higher the minimum wage is, the greater the temptation for employers to illegally underpay, and you need some enforcement mechanism on that. And it will also be the case that employers may be responding to higher minimum wage uh, wages in, in ways that are undesirable. Um, and all of this has lessons for uh, other countries. Um, so let me talk about um, some of those. So many other countries, including Greece, as Vasilis mentioned in his introductory remarks, have followed the UK in, uh, construct, in having an independent expert committee to make recommendations on the minimum wage. The exact way in which it's formulated varies a lot, but I think in many ways the UK Low Pay Commission um, was you know, the model for, for, for the, how you should, should do things. Um, and I think, you know, in an ideal world, the idea is that this can committee has the, all the evidence at its, at its fingertips to say, well, if I have the minimum wage at this level, this is what will happen. If I have the minimum wage at some other level, um, this is what will happen. Um, and then it chooses the best option. Um, but the problem is often we don't really have evidence about, for example, levels of minimum wage we haven't tried before. We only know we have evidence on what ha has been done. So I think one of the things is that we sometimes actually need, um, not we do need evidence-based policy making, but I sometimes think we also need what I like to call policy-based evidence making. So sometimes the policy actually has to go out into the unknown. Uh, a little bit um, in order to find out what is going to happen. The experts on their own cannot know what is going to happen. Um, but having said that, I think you need to do that, um, and the national living wage would be an example in the UK context, you do have to be, pre be prepared to backtrack if the evidence shows that what you thought might have been a good idea turns out not to be. And, you know, and I think that that, you know, and sometimes people say, well, that's really, really hard. You know, we're trying to find the right level of the minimum wage, uh, sort of we're in the fog and we're trying to find the top of the mountain. But there's a sort of a cliff. And if we walk too far and we drop off the cliff, there's no no going back. But I don't really think there's any real cliff edge here. So if you push the minimum wage, for example, a little bit too far and then you come to come to realize, oh, actually, it went a bit too far. All you would do is have slightly lower increases for a number of years, and that would, as generally wages rise, as is normally the case, you would sort of go back to where you were before. So I don't think you should be too afraid about sometimes um, taking some risks. You, you know, you start, sometimes do have to take um, some risks, calculated risks, but risks nonetheless. Um, the other thing is that don't expect too much from the minimum wage, uh, and in particular in how it addressing its poverty. It is a useful tool for addressing poverty, but it's a rather blunt instrument. And the reason for that is that the minimum wage um, normally um, is a minimum hourly wage. It might be converted to a monthly um, level. I think in Greece that's, that's quite common. Um, but poverty depends upon household income, and that depends not just on your hourly wage, but whether you're in work at all, how many hours you work, how many others in the household work, what they're earning when they work, how many dependents there are. And there's no way that a minimum wage on its own can target all of these things. So it can be useful to combine, I think, a minimum wage with sort of in-work benefits uh, for the low paid, which are sort of 
means tested based on the household income. And sometimes people, um, you know, say, oh, well, you know, the in-work benefits are a substitute for the minimum wage, but I think they're actually a complement. I think they naturally kind of go together. The risk if you have in-work benefits without a minimum wage is that you're just allowing employers to cut wages um, and take some of the benefits that are intended for uh, low-income workers. Um, the final um, sort of things I talked about with the potential sort of concern is sort of employer responses to uh, higher minimum wages. And I think the evidence here is still less clear, but I think there's sort of some anecdotal evidence and you know, people are looking at it, but I, I, I don't, you know, I, I think we don't quite know at the moment. So in, in the UK, there does seem to be some illegal, there is some illegal underpayment and that quite possibly is increasing as the minimum wage rises and enforcement has not really kept um, pace with that. I think there was one calculation you're likely to be um, inspected um, something like uh, once every few hundred years if you're an employer. Uh, so it's not really much of a, a threat. Uh, a second kind of problem is that um, the minimum wage only applies to employees. Um, there is no minimum wage for the self-employed. Um, and so there's something of an attendancy, a temptation for employers to classify were their workers as self-employed independent contractors rather than employees. And so we see legal fights in the UK, for example, over whether Uber drivers are workers, employees entitled to the minimum wage, or are they independent self-employed contractors who would, would not be. And also employers may well be becoming more careful about the hours that they actually pay for. So um, in the UK, there's the phenomenon of zero hours contracts. They don't commit to offering any certain number of hours. There are no guaranteed hours. And this can lead to um, income volatility for what are low income households. So you just wouldn't know how many hours um, you're going to get to the work. And the concern here is that employers now they have to pay a higher minimum wage for each hour. They might suddenly in the minimum minimum in the middle of the day tell you, oh well, we haven't got any customers at the moment. I'm, I don't want to employ you for the next hour. Um, and you know, you go and amuse yourself. And you know, that's sort of not very, not very um, good. Okay. One other topic that I think is important is whether I've talked about the minimum wage as if there's a single uh, minimum wage, um, but there is a question about what variation there should be in, in the minimum wage. And the UK um, system has some uh, variation in the minimum wage by age, as, as do many other countries. Um, and, and the idea behind it is that wages generally are uh, lower for, for younger workers. Um, perhaps uh, they are, the younger workers are less likely to have uh, dependents. Um, um, you know, they may be not minimum wages for their whole life. Uh, and it's, you know, when we're talking about workers at the start of their career, we may think it's more important to make sure they have a job rather than to, to, to raise their, um, their, their earnings. Um, it should be said that, you know, many UK employers um, don't uh, vary the minimum wage. Um, make much use of the variation that's allowed for one reason or another. So it's in practice often less important than it looks on paper. Um, but there also, you know, there are other sorts of variation you might have. Some people have argued for regional variation um, in, in the minimum wage to reflect differences in, in prevailing level of earnings in different parts of country. Um, and I think the Greek system has had, in, at least in the past, some age variation, but also perhaps more unusually, it had some variation by marital status um, and sort of labour market experience. I may, I hope I'm, I'm not sure if I'm quite right. Vasilis is nodding, so I'm hoping that's reasonably um, accurate. And that's quite unusual. But again, I think you, you might think you could justify that, you know, in, in terms of, you know, the more likely to be workers in, 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 um, in poverty. If you're married, maybe with dependent children, you might be more concerned about child poverty than you are about adult poverty. Um, and also, actually, when we were thinking about the, the national living wage in the UK, we actually thought about linking it to labour market experience rather than just age. But I think the trade off here is between a simple system has some virtues, everybody understands it. Um, but um, and if you have a lot of complication, you probably make it becomes harder to, to enforce. Um, but at the same time, there are some arguments to about fine tuning the minimum wage to different labour markets. So it's about striking the right uh, balance there. 
So what does the, all of this mean um, for, uh, for Greece? So I'll just make um, a few observations. So first of all, if you just compare uh, the level of minimum wages uh, around the world, um, I put some selected countries on here, Greece. Um, um, I put you know, some countries with very high minimum wages, some big countries. Um, I've also put um, you know, uh, sort of one Eastern European countries, Southern European countries on here. So it's a sort of selection. Um, so the, the minimum wages in Greece is not the lowest that we see in the OECD, but it, it's, it's one, uh, one of the lowest, a bit under um, sort of six US dollars uh, an hour equivalent. Um, you know, whereas, you know, in the UK, we're talking about something over $11 uh, an hour. But I think that comparison is, is not a particularly helpful one because um, average wages vary a lot across these countries as, uh, as well. And, um, you know, so it makes much, if you want to ask the question, how high is the minimum wage? It doesn't, just saying it's $6 an hour doesn't really make a great deal of economic sense. It's much more meaningful to compare it to the prevailing level of wages. So to look at the minimum wage as a percentage of the average or the median um, in, in this case. Uh, and if you do that, um, you see that you've got sort of countries like the UK where it's sort of pushing up towards 60% at the moment with a target to go higher. Um, there are other countries, France is even higher than that. Um, you know, they're countries that are sort of very low. The US is uh, at 30 percent, though this is the federal minimum. In many states, it would be higher than that. And Greece then on these figures comes out as about 50 um, percent of the median. So it's sort of where many, country, uh, many countries seem to be. So in that sense, the level of minimum wage is currently prevailing in Greece um, seems, um, you know, it's sort of middle of the middle of the pack sort of thing. Um, how has that changed over time? Um, well, obviously, Greece has been through a very, very traumatic um, economic crisis. Um, there was a big nominal cut in the minimum wage um, in, in that period. And you can see that the minimum wage as a percentage of median earnings um, fell a lot. And then it sort of recovered, um, recovered somewhat since then. Um, um, in terms of the incidence of, of low pay, again, these are sort of OECD figures. Um, this is defined as the percentage paid less than two thirds of the median. Um, and there you can see a very high levels of inequality in, in the United States. Uh, <coughs> here, Greece uh, looks to be one of the, um, having a relatively low um, incidence of, of low pay compared to a number of uh, other countries on the, on the low side. Um, now, I think some things that are, you know, that are a bit distinctive possibly about um, the Greek economy are first that it has a very high share of self-employment. So you can see here this again OECD figures that something over about like a third of workers are self-employed. It's important to remember the minimum wage does not apply to, um, to the self-employed. So that limits the effectiveness of, of it as, as a policy. It may also be easier for to move people from employee to self-employed status. And in many countries, that's a lot higher than many countries, the country like the UK, although it's risen is something more like 15 uh, 15%. Um, it's also um, Greece has more informality than most OECD countries in um, in its economy. So these are estimates of the undeclared economy as a percentage of GDP, and um, you know Greece's estimate on the high side estimated around almost a quarter of the economy. And you know what this means is there's. I mean, this isn't just about not paying the minimum wage. It's a whole range of um, informality and um, not paying, you know, not comp complying with this regulation and that regulation. But in most countries, you would tend to see uh, underpayment of the minimum wage as being part of that. So one thing that I think is not a very good policy is to have a high minimum wage on paper and then not enforce it on in, in, in practice. I think it would be much better to have a more modest wage properly, uh, properly enforced. And a number of countries in the world uh, do have uh, very high minimum wages on paper, but in practice, in most employers don't pay it and there's very little level of enforcement. I think other issues that might possibly be important is that, for example, in a country like the UK, 
Uh, most minimum wage workers are in non-traded parts of the economy. So, for example, many of them are going to be working in restaurants and, and hotels, and uh, most of the customers um, for those, you know, in those restaurants and people in those hotels are, um, you know, are, are British people. They're not sort of, um, you know, whereas in Greece, that may well be, be, be less true. There's much more in the way of that. I think there are reasons why British people go on holiday to Greece uh, more commonly than Greek people come on holiday to the UK that perhaps I, I won't uh, go into um, here. Um, and, you know, another thing is that, um, you know, the UK has high employment uh, rates for groups uh, which often have rather low levels of employment. So in some sense, a focus on making work pay um, is a, a very sensible strategy for a country like the UK when you don't, you know, when getting people into jobs, there doesn't seem much more scope for, for doing that. But Greece continues to have very high unemployment among some groups. And so in just in terms of priorities, the minimum wage doesn't do anything for people who are not in work. So it may be that reducing unemployment um, becomes more, uh, more of a priority there. So I'll just try and, and wrap up. I'm sorry, I'm, I think I'm a little bit over uh, time. So I think, you know, the minimum wage can be part of a strategy uh, to reduce poverty and inequality. You can do that without causing big job losses, but you mustn't expect too much and don't try to use it to achieve anything. Um, and I think, you know, there are useful lessons to be learned from international uh, experience, but you've also got to be careful always to take account of uh, local circumstances. Uh, so thank you very much. And I will um, finish there. Uh, thank you, Alan. Thank you for keeping also uh, the time. Uh, I'll pass the floor on to our first discussion to Manolis. Manolis, as you prepare your PowerPoint, I think Alan uh, also had some very useful insights towards the end uh, about the case of Greece. So I think we can start um, uh, link the discussion there. Uh, can I just remind the audience to keep uh, putting your, your questions in the Q&A uh, Q box and we'll pick them up after the round of discussion by our discussions. Manoli, the floor is yours. Okay, um, so thank you very much for the invitation to, um, to present here, uh, to discuss this uh, very interesting um, presentation by Alan. Uh, I will essentially pick up from uh, where he left and discuss actually the case of, uh, of Greece. Um, so, um, okay, this is perhaps repeating a little bit what, uh, what Alan has already mentioned, but um, um, so the key policy challenge when, when setting minimum wages is to uh, achieve a balance uh, in the trade-off between uh, the wage gains for the low paid that uh, occur when you increase the minimum wage uh, versus the potential employment losses. And um, recent research has suggested that employment losses could actually be very low or, or maybe, uh, maybe not even any, um, if the minimum wage is set at a, at a reasonable level. So not a trivial level, but, uh, but at a reasonable level. So, um, so let me suggest two criteria uh, for assessing whether the minimum wage is appropriate, and I will use those to uh, discuss essentially the, the Greek experience. So first, how productive is the economy? Um, and that's going to be reflected essentially by the wages that prevail within the country. So we usually want, um, uh, we usually express the minimum wage as a share of median or average wages as, uh, as Alan just uh, showed as well. Um, and secondly, uh, how high is the unemployment rate? Um, again, uh, if you think that uh, there are some potential, uh, there's a potential cost of employment losses from increasing the minimum wage, how much weight should you put on that employment loss? Uh, if you're in a full employment economy like the UK, perhaps that's not such a big deal. People can find jobs anyway. Uh, if you're in an economy with a high unemployment rate, maybe that's more important. Um, so, okay, so with this criteria, I want to essentially take a look at the um, um, experience with uh, minimum wage policy uh, of Greece. Um, and I'm going to do this uh, for the periods before the crisis, uh, during the crisis and, and after the crisis. Um, and I'm gonna give also some thoughts about uh, future policy uh, as well. Uh, so the first thing I want to do actually is I want to describe a little bit the labor market in Greece uh, before the crisis. Um, because you, you had two uh, somewhat contrasting trends uh, in the years before the crisis. So the first thing that, uh, to note is that um, in the 15 years, uh, 14, 15 years before uh, the crisis, 
Greece actually had very, very high growth rates uh, for an advanced economy. So it actually had the second highest growth rate in the European Union uh, at the time. Um, at the same time as this very high growth, uh, the labor market performances in Greece was actually very poor. So the unemployment rate uh, in 2008, which was the peak uh, of, of, the, of the business cycle for Greece, roughly, uh, was 8%. Okay, so that's, that's actually a fairly high unemployment rate um, you know, to follow essentially 15 years of uninterrupted and fast growth. And this was actually the second highest unemployment rate in the European Union uh, at, at the time. Okay, and um, it would have been likely even higher, um, except for massive hiring in the public sector that occurred in the, in the 2000s, which was probably not very uh, productive. Um, now, even worse than this very high unemployment rate was that uh, specific groups of uh, potential workers uh, actually fared even worse. So the unemployment rate for women was 12%, for young people, it was, it was twice as the national one, it was uh, more than twice, it was 17%. Um, and perhaps even worse, um, more than half or about half of the unemployed uh, were out of a job for more than a year. So once you lost your job, it was actually very, very hard to get back uh, on track on the, on the labor market. Uh, so this difficulty in accessing jobs, uh, and particularly so for, uh, uh, you know, for women and, uh, and young and long-term unemployed, is a source of great inequality. Um, was a source of great inequality in the Greek labor market uh, that went beyond sort of the, the usual way we measure inequality as inequality among the employed. So if you look at all the potential workers, um, okay, so there was a great many of them that could not even get a, a job. Okay, um, so those two, uh, those two facts seem a little paradoxical. Um, okay, so uh, usually we think of poor uh, labor market performance as being the result of low growth. Yeah, unemployment is high because the economy is not growing very much. Um, but that's not the case. That was not the case in Greece uh, at the time. Okay? So, so what's going on here? Um, so it turns out this is an experience. Um, so many other European countries had a similar experience uh, in, in the previous decades. And it even, you know, th this experience even has a word. It's called uh, eurosclerosis. Um, so that essentially happens when you have poorly designed uh, labor market institutions. Uh, and what they do is that they discourage these institutions, they discourage job creation, uh, even when uh, there is high economic growth. Okay? Um, so what are these labor market institutions? Um, they might be the minimum wage and the wage determination mechanisms. Uh, it could be employment protection legislation uh, or uh, the way unemployment insurance is organized. Uh, unemployment insurance is not particularly relevant in the Greek case because it's not, uh, uh, it's not particularly widespread. Okay. Um, so now I will turn to the minimum wage and, and describe ways in which uh, it was actually part uh, of, of the reason uh, why you had this very poor uh, labor market performance uh, despite uh, high growth. So first I want to look at uh, the evolution of the Greek minimum wage uh, before the crisis. So on this graph that I've plotted here, uh, so on the horizontal axis here, you have time. Okay, so it shows you the evolution of the minimum wage uh, between the early 2000s and uh, during that decade. Uh, the green line here uh, is the, uh, the minimum wage. It starts at about 23 uh, euros uh, per day, uh, and it goes up to maybe 32, 33, uh, right before the crisis. Um, so of course, looking at the absolute level of the, of the minimum wage is not the most useful uh, metric. Uh, a more useful metric is to look at the minimum wage as a share of the average uh, wage. Uh, and the average wage here, this is for uh, uh, workers employed at the private sector. Uh, so for, uh, for Greek members of the audience, these are uh, workers who are insured at ICA, uh, which is the main social security fund uh, for uh, private sector salaried workers. Uh, so what you can see is that during this decade, uh, essentially the, the minimum wage as a share of average earnings um, was fairly stable at about 60%. Uh, now, if you compare this, uh, this share with other countries, uh, it's actually fairly high. So in the case of the UK and Germany, uh, it was 55 and 48% respectively as a share of the median wage. And actually the median wage is always quite a bit lower than the uh, average wage, it's maybe 10 to 20% lower. So uh, if you were to um, look at the, at the ratio of the Greek minimum wage to the median wage in Greece, you probably go over 70%. Um, 
Okay, so, uh, so the punchline here is that uh, Greece in that time had actually a fairly high minimum wage by international standards. Um, even more so actually, um, more, um, the minimum wage that was applicable to many people was, was higher than that, exactly because you had a seniority bonus and a marriage bonus. So uh, your, the minimum wage that applied to some people could go up from you know, 740 euros be, right before the crisis to more than 1,000 uh, euros per month. Okay, so you could go up to you know, by almost 50%. Uh, even more so, um, um, the national minimum wage formed the basis for uh, the negotiations for uh, um, about 100 sectoral minimum wages and 90 occupational uh, minimum wages. So, uh, so what this means is that you had this very rigid system of minimum wages, which uh, the level of which was very high, uh, which probably discouraged, uh, contributed to the discouraging of, of job creation and uh, discouraged the um, hiring uh, of uh, sort of more marginal workers. And it seems to have been, uh, it's likely to have been a, a key factor uh, in explaining this uh, labor market underperformance uh, during those years of high growth. Um, now, going forward, this, this rigidity actually uh, became even more pronounced uh, during the crisis. Okay. So as you're, as you're probably all uh, aware, in the 2010s, uh, so Greece had a Great Depression level uh, economic crisis. Uh, so this figure here shows you basically everything you need to know about this uh, as far as the labor market is concerned. So on the horizontal axis, again, we have uh, time uh, going from 2008 onwards. And I'm plotting two lines here. Uh, the blue line uh, shows employment. Again, these are private sector, these are full-time private sector employees. Uh, and the red line is the average wage uh, in the private sector uh, among full-time workers. So what you can, and the, the two lines here are normalized to 100 uh, in two, at the end of 2008, which is essentially the, the, the peak of the, of the business cycle. So what you can see is that when the crisis hit around 2010, 2011, employment, uh, private sector employment collapsed. It collapsed by about 25%. So uh, about half a million people lost their, uh, their jobs uh, during that time uh, in, in the next couple of years. However, and, and that's very strange, uh, if you think about it, wages for the workers who kept their jobs actually did not decline uh, almost at all. Okay, um, and, and that should, should sound strange because you know, if, you, if you have a firm that suddenly cannot sell its products and has to reduce its costs, there's two ways you can reduce your labor costs. You can fire workers, or you can reduce the wages of, uh, of, of the workers on your payroll. And somehow this second uh, option of reducing wages does not seem to have been used or, or not very much. Okay, uh, so the question just is- Just interrupt, uh, one minute please, we're running out of time. Okay, um, all right, so then, uh, so, so what happened then, uh, and I think that, that clarifies why, why wages didn't drop, is that uh, when you see this red line here, in the early 2012, you had a big, labor market liberalization, which among other things reduced the minimum wage by 22%. And subsequent to that, you see that first of all, employment stabilized. So the number of employees stopped dropping and wages dropped, okay, instead. Okay. So, um, so again, that, that uh, period um, basically is when the labor market started, started recovering. Uh, so again, uh, um, so I want, what I want to stress here is that 2012, 2013, the economy was still contracting and nevertheless, um, uh, the economy was contracting, but employment stabilized because it was lower wages that took up essentially the burn of, uh, uh, of the adjustment. Okay, so, um, so, to, uh, so to conclude here th this part, um, this high and rigid level of minimum wages uh, made it much more harder, made it much harder for the economy to adjust to this very important uh, negative shock and led to much more uh, loss of jobs than would otherwise have been the case had, uh, for example, wages been allowed to decline. Uh, Manoli, I'm afraid we'll have to leave it here. Uh, if, if you don't mind, we have to leave it here. We may pick up okay. uh, some of the, of the points you have in the rest of the presentation a bit later in the discussion. I need to manage sure. the time. So thank okay. you very much. Uh, I'll pass the floor to Antigone. I'm sure we're gonna come back to this in, in the discussion. Antigone. You're muted, Antigone. modesty and cats. Okay, uh, thank you for the invitation. It has been uh, a pleasure to uh, listen to Professor Manning and also read his uh, paper and the presentation and also think again about these uh, 
uh, questions regarding minimum wages and uh, labor market performance and labor market institutions, and also comparisons, because it's very important to compare. Right, so I would, um, I would be very um, keen in um, um, adopting um, a generous uh, uh, minimum wage policy because it sounds right, because it goes to people who get low, low, low pay and stuff. Uh, the the first um, reaction would be that it everybody and Professor Manning also uh, seem to agree that after a certain point, uh, higher minimum wages can cause uh, employment losses, and up to a point also they can um, somehow um, penalize outsiders and re reward insiders. So in a sense, it can, it can also create this kind of stuff. But when trying to compare the, the, the performance of the, of the UK labor market with the Greek labor market, one would start by uh, stating the obvious that was also mentioned by Professor Manning, that the informal economy in Greece is um, a, a, about a quarter of the GDP which also corresponds to 32% self-employment and also 55% of the employment uh, is happening in very small enterprises employing from one to nine employees, workers. Now, this, um, this feeds undeclared and underdeclared work and makes um, fine tuning of the labor market much more difficult because it creates an opaque uh, screen behind which things can happen and some of them can be very uh, nasty. Now, if you also uh, see how this uh, situation um, interacts with other labor market institutions, such as high employment protection uh, regulation as um, uh, Manuel Galenos has just uh, mentioned, and also a very high tax wedge, uh, you end up uh, not being so surprised that even during the good times of uh, fast GDP growth, uh, the, the Greek case has been characterized as a jobless growth case. Uh, jobs were not created um, not only at the same rate as uh, new wealth was created, but it sort of uh, remained uh, 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 completely frozen. Um, the, the, the second thing that I would like to, to raise is this. I'm, I, I was um, very interested to see that part of the success of the minimum wage uh, rises in, in the UK uh, was its delinking with the rest of the, of the wage uh, ladder, I mean, the wage distribution. Now, in Greece, uh, as far as I remember myself, quite a long time, the negotiations around the minimum wage by uh, the trade unions and the employers were um, basically... Uh, um, using the minimum wage as the most important rhetorical weapon. Why were all these um, public sector trade unions so uh, crazy about uh, ensuring a rise in the minimum wage? In the minimum wage, it was because the rise of the minimum wage was um, transferred immediately to the whole of the wage uh, distribution. Not only that, but it, it sort of rolled over with uh, a faster uh, increase because the minimum wage was the absolute minimum increase that could be negotiated at professional, sectoral, firm level. Anything higher than that would be acceptable, but nothing less than that, which means that while the the, the, the public discourse was dominated by the plight of low wage workers and their, their need to you know, have uh, an increase in their wage, wages. In reality, the, a, a whole um, uh, spiral process of uh, wage hikes was set in motion that was 
terribly uh, destructive concerning um, uh, the external competitiveness of Greece and was also partly the reason why lots of economic activities moved away from the tradable sectors and into the untradable sectors. And I was expecting Manolis Galianos to, 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 to mention this. So we don't, we can't really say uh, what would have happened if we did not have this kind of rigid labor market institutions plus tax wedge plus unfriendly to employment uh, regulations plus uh, um, um, how shall I put it nicely uh, not very sincere um, negotiations uh, about uh, low paid people because basically it was the 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 the, the step to move uh, um, the whole uh, uh, wage ladder upwards. But we know what happened after the wage cuts of, of 2012. Until two years into the crisis, when everything was collapsing, the, the, the state, the, the budget, uh, the, 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 the international position of the country, uh, Greece was um, uh, on the verge of... Uh, increasing further the minimum wage. And then there was this uh, decision to freeze it and to, to cut it by 20%. The idea at the time, the Greek minimum wage before the seniority and family uh, top-ups was higher than Portugal, higher than uh, uh, Spain's, and higher than Slovenia and than Malta's. I mean, this is um, something which is very telling about uh, um, the, the situation in Greece. After this brutal um, um, stabilization programs, uh, it is interesting that uh, if we look at the um, at uh, income distribution, the the picture of um, inequality was lower in 2019 compared to one year before the crisis, 2007. It, it sounds paradoxical. And what is also a little bit paradoxical is the fact that um, the rate of poverty somehow declined. Uh, what I want to say is that in, uh, in, uh, in labor markets where we don't have very good data and very clear discussions uh, and honest exchange of views about what we want to do, who we want to benefit, and how do we find out if we actually manage to do what we wanted to do, uh, it is very difficult to uh, evaluate um, a worthy tool uh, for... Um, um, in order to see if it is important to do it. Let me finish by mentioning what uh, the IMF technical assistance uh, review on the micro data necessary in order to monitor um, minimum wages uh, um, concluded. This, this, this happened uh, a year ago. They said that um, there, the, the main problem with the micro data in uh, concerning the labor market and uh, um, in, in Greece in general is not so much the content of the information um, collected, but uh, the main problem is the lack of sharing of this information to um, uh, researchers, uh, trade unionists, I don't know who, who else, and that this is one major problem that cannot uh, feed uh, uh, informed debates. How, having said that, however, they came, they went further to say that there is a major information gap regarding the data available. And this is the identification of minimum wage workers, which is necessary in order to see uh, questions of coverage, but also necessary to see who is going to benefit, who lives with him and or her in the same household? Does she work? Does he take a benefit? Is he or she a pensioner? So this lack of information um, makes it very difficult to go ahead and produce uh, 
policy-based evidence making. I mean, we cannot do that because we cannot follow it. We cannot monitor it because there, this information is not even collected, let alone shared. So, um, Adigoni, can you also wrap up in the next 10 seconds, please? Yes, the final issue is compliance. As you can imagine, compliance is a major issue, but not the biggest one uh, regard, regarding the rest that we discussed. So I would say that um, it is important to learn from international experience, but it is important to reveal the characteristics of each particular individual labor market. And when there is interaction, interactions with other institutions that produce toxic results, it's better to think a little bit more and go for in-wage benefits, negative income tax, I don't know what, but not use minimum wages um, in a foolish way that it was used in the past. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Andigoni. Thank you to Manolis. And Alan, I think you have a harder job now than for the presentation. So quite a few issues. Uh, Raised. I don't know if you would like to respond to some of the things that Digoni said and also Manolis. I think the issue about how the minimum wage seems uh, in the descriptive data in 2012 to have uh, done marvels and stopped the unemployed, the, the, the job decline. Uh, although we also saw in 2019 when we increased the minimum wage, nothing bad happened. Uh, but also that uh, the issues that Digoni said about so the complementarity with other institutions, uh, enforcement, and, and everything else. Alan, the floor to you. Um, well, thank you very much for those um, very um, useful, insightful um, comments. I'll, I'll just make a, a few observations. I mean, the first thing is that clearly there's something about the Greek labour market somewhere that doesn't work terribly well. Its employment rates are too low. The unemployment rates are, are, are too high. I think disentangling exactly what that is, is not so you know, so, so easy. I mean, and, um, you know, so, and, and I haven't studied it in detail, so I don't have any very strong, uh, strong views. I mean, I'll, I'll say a couple of things about the other sort of labour market institutions that were sort of mentioned. I mean, first of all, you know, I, I'm not a big fan personally of very strong um, employment protection legislation. Um, you know, although in the UK I've been generally arguing that we should, you know, use the minimum wage more aggressively, I'm not out there saying that the UK should in, introduce employment protection laws like many Southern European countries have, you know, have ha have or have had in, in in the past. And secondly, I I think it's it's really important that the minimum wage is about minimum wages. I think when it starts getting linked to other things. I think that can be um, a little bit um, problematic because it's important in deciding on the level of the minimum wage that you're focusing on how it affects the people who you know, are likely to be paid the minimum wage and their prospects of employment and so on. If that minimum wage is then linked to other wages in the economy, and those other groups then have some set, you know, they, they care about their wages rather than the minimum wage workers. I think that isn't, uh, personally, I doesn't strike me as such a, that linkage is not so such a great, um, great, great um, system. But I think I'd also say that it's quite, you know, I mean, what um, was said about data um, and looking at evidence is, is kind of really, really important. So for example, I took figures when I showed you the level of the minimum wage as a percentage of average earnings. I took all those figures from the, from the OECD. They had the Greek minimum wage, you know, at a lower level than Manolis showed from the National Bank of Greece. I don't know enough about the data sources to be able to, you know, reconcile those two things. But it's really important that someone is, is there trying to do that and that they have, have the data. And I think what was said about data being publicly available is really, really important as, as well. Because one of the effects of the low pay commission in, in the UK is that prior to that, we often had both employer groups and unions sort of posing, putting out demands for what they wanted the minimum wage to be without really providing anything in the way of evidence to back up those claims. And there was a sort of a certain amount of political posing on both sides. Um, the unions push asking for a very high number, the employers for a very low number. 
And the low pay commission meant, well, meant that you said to those groups, OK, you can make those arguments, but you have to bring us the evidence, you know, to back up that case. You can't just issue a press release and demand something. And I think that that is a really, um, you know, it was a really important point. Data widely shared, having many people the ability to, you know, present the cases, as Vasilis has said, you know, I know there's, you know, work about when the minimum wage was then again raised again in 2019, that they didn't seem employment losses from that. There may be other people who say, no, I've looked at the data and it's different, but that's all very, very important at finding a good, you know, a good policy, having that sort of debate out there um, in the open. Thank you very much, uh, Alan. Uh, and indeed, when you were saying uh, about the, the different demands and how they were not really evidence-based, I remember in my experience in, in 2018 in the minimum wage committee that we had on the hand the unions asking for a 25% increase, and then the, the the Bank of Greece asking for a 0% increase. Uh, and uh, you can see there's a big range in, in, in the demands. Let me bring in questions from uh, the audience. I would like to start with a question by and I'm trying to follow names uh, as well as questions. So by William Ellison, uh, which, uh, who's a, a, a civil service economist in the UK, I imagine. And he says that you mentioned that uh, beyond some level, an increase in the minimum wage could uh, affect uh, uh, unemployment. Have you done any analysis of what is the optimal level? And for example, MPs from the Labour Party are calling for a 15 pound uh, per hour minimum wage. Do you think this would have uh, a negative uh, employment effect. I will start to dilute a bit from the Greek discussion, and then we'll go back to the Greek discussion. Alan? Um, yeah, so I mean, I think that's a really good question. What's the highest you can push the minimum wage without having very obvious job losses? I, you know, I, in the UK, and I think my impression is also in the US, we still haven't really got to the point where there's very, very clear um, evidence. I mean, I've argued for higher minimum wages in the UK for a number of years, but even I've been sort of a little bit surprised by how high you seem to be able to push them without any very obvious job losses emerging. I mean, that may be particular, um, um, particular to, to the UK. Now, if we come to, a, a, you know, it's a very UK specific question, I mean, a £15 um, minimum wage in the UK would be above average earnings currently, median earnings. That would be a really, really high uh, minimum wage. So I don't think that I would kind of want to jump from where we are now to that. Um, and I think it's more that's more about the sort of the political posing in some sense that we sort of talked a bit about, Vasilis perhaps sort of mentioned a little bit. Um, that you know that was the left of the Labour Party doing that. I doubt very much if that's going to become Labour Party policy at the next um, next election. They'll probably argue be arguing for a higher minimum wage, but not up to fifteen pounds an hour. Lovely. Uh, I would like to bring two questions that uh, relate uh, more more to Greece. Uh, one is from a good colleague, uh, Professor Matsaganis. Uh, who quotes a paper, a forthcoming paper by uh, Dustman and Corthos in the QJE. Uh, that shows that German firms adjusted to the minimum wage by raising the game. The higher wage constraint led to higher investment to raise productivity. And this is a common argument about sort of more innovation. And uh, doesn't this suggest that although we cannot, you cannot engineer growth by raising wages alone, a high minimum wage can under certain conditions act as spur to the upgrade of a country's growth model. I will address this question to all three uh, members of the panel, if that's OK. But also a second question, uh, so that I don't interrupt you all the time. Um, by colleague uh, Ioannis Kaplanis, uh, who takes issue with the, uh, what you mentioned, Alan, earlier, that uh, informal underpayment in the UK, so you have uh, law enforcement, and also Antigone picked up on the issue, and says that uh, in the in Greece, uh, uh, the experience and anecdotal evidence is quite the opposite, that the minimum wage has been quite low. The employers agree uh, to the employees to pay what is formally the minimum wage and give extra money under the table so to, so to avoid uh, social security contributions. So there's actually informal overpayment beyond the minimum wage. If that is the case, could this be taken as a signal that the minimum wage should be or can be increased uh, uh, further? So I'll I'll I'll, uh, I'll pass the floor to Alan, and then if I, if you may, Antigone and Manolis, you can come into the two questions. 
Um, well, I think on the first thing, I mean, that paper by Christian Dussmann about uh, the impact of the minimum wage in Germany is really, really interesting. It's sort of hinting at sort of how the adjustment mechanisms, you know, trying to answer the question why, um, you know, the impact of the minimum wage on employment is not uh, negative rather than just what the impact is, which a lot of the literature has done. Um, and I think, you know, there are also a number of papers, some interesting research come out of the US, which sort of shows using sort of um, data from an individual company that when they raise the minimum wage, actually the productivity of individual workers went up as a result. So in some sense, it comes to pay for itself through higher wages. But I think there are questions. I mean, there probably is some ability to do that. Um, but I think there are also going to be some limits to do, doing that. I mean, we can't simply legislate our self-hire minimum wages forever and then the, just hope the productivity and the investment will come to, to justify that. Um, in terms of, um, you know, the Greek um, situation, I mean, I've, I, you know, I, I, I'm loath to make any comments because I don't know about it. But obviously, if, for example, how much people are actually receiving um, are, are being paid more than is apparent in, you know, the social security records and, and so on, um, that is one possible reason why, you know, you would, you might get the minimum wage looking quite high on one data source and uh, lower on another that perhaps asked about households about their income from, from surveys. But I, I perhaps I'd let the discussants probably are going to be more informative on that particular question than, than me. Thanks, Andy Gorni. Thank you. Yes, in um, responding to Manos, uh, of course, in, in, in principle and in theory and logically, uh, raising um, the minimum wages can create uh, more enthusiasm and commitment on the part of uh, uh, workers and can also direct the efforts of um, employers into um, productivity enhancing innovations and stuff. But this is the good story. And uh, the, the reality is more of a mixed bag because the, the thing is that if you, um, if you, if you um, restrict uh, the emphasis on this, you cannot deal with a question of a labor market which has the lowest uh, employment rate in the EU, the lowest employment rate of women in the EU, the lowest employment rate of young people in the EU. And one wonders uh, if employers are so uh, willing to excel in innovation and high productivity, uh, what stops them? I mean, is it the level of the minimum wage that stops them? If it is, if it was higher, they would become more entrepreneurial. I don't buy this because I've I've heard these arguments in empty political slogans and in completely uh, senseless uh, political confrontation. When in reality, the issue was how to ensure increases for the middle level wages and even for the high uh, level wages. So I, I think that although it can work like that, I, I wouldn't uh, uh, bet my life that it will happen in Greece. Now, regarding the, the under the table um, agreement- You're going a bit, a bit faster on the second okay. question, if you don't the, mind. The other question is this, huh? okay. Yes. Um, it is very common for, because the tax wage is very high, because, um, um, taxes are high because, because, because bureaucracy is so high, it is very common for employers to make arrangements to pay the minimum wage to their employees and give the rest in cash or under the table or black or whatever you call it. This is something that is a byproduct of a very rigid and uh, heavily um, employment hostile uh, institutional setup. This cannot be addressed with raising or lowering minimum wages. It has to be addressed uh, with different kind of tools. Thank you. Thanks, Manoli. Just a 
two minutes. Yes. So on the, on the question of Manos Matsaganis, um, so Alan gave the broad response with which I agree completely. Uh, you, know, you cannot engineer long-term growth in this way. I want to give a slightly narrower response with this respect of uh, uh, Greece's experience in 2019. At that time, the minimum wage was raised by 11%. And there was a very detailed study by the World Bank which showed that uh, on the one hand workers gained, uh, low wage workers gained. Um, however, employment in low wage firms uh, increased 2% uh, less than it otherwise would have. So overall employment was growing, so, so you didn't have losses per se, but you didn't have as many gains as you might otherwise have had. Now, from a reallocation point of view, this does indeed reallocate employment towards uh, higher wage and presumably higher productivity firms. So that's consistent with, the, with what was found in Germany. Now, in the specific case of Greece, uh, which had an unemployment rate of uh, something like 17% in 2019, um, you know, one might argue, uh, as, as Alan has, that uh, it's a priority to focus on creating jobs, even low, low, low wage jobs, um, and getting people out of unemployment and then only subsequently uh, try to uh, find people high wage jobs. Um, so, so that would be the, the Greek case here. Um, now on, on, the, on the second question about the informality, uh, again, I think uh, uh, what Andy Wani said is absolutely correct. And I think um, sort of reducing uh, the tax wedge, reducing social security contributions for low paid workers might be a way of bringing them into the formal labor market. So we don't have to do all this guesswork about what are they actually paid uh, taking them out uh, or, or having a setting where a lot of workers are outside of the formal structure and therefore they don't have uh, or this, the formal labor market structure and then, therefore they don't have all the protections, the legal protections that workers uh, should have. Thank you. Uh, good. Uh, let me pass to, uh, to a, a number of questions that have come with uh, in relation to developing countries. So how, uh, one question was how COVID affected the minimum wage potential in developing countries. I'm sure somebody has a ready-made best answer to this uh, question. But uh, also another question uh, by Roberto Mauricio Sanchez uh, saying that um, in developing countries, of course, we have a lot of informality things we mentioned, high self-employment, weak unions. So is there a particular role of minimum wages as a policy there? Uh, I guess developing countries, uh, the question doesn't include Greece in the group of developing uh, uh, countries. Uh, and related to that, another question asking whether regional minimum wages, um, a question coming from Colombia actually, um, uh, it would be more relevant for developing countries. So this is a bit more on, on the theoretical uh, side. And if I can slip in another uh, question as well by Kostadunis Gorgulsakis, who says that if, you're, if your wage income is not enough, you will be going looking for a second job. Do we know anything about whether minimum wages reduce the, the, the incidence of second job holding, and in that sense, redistributing employment to the unemployed. So I guess that question I would pass on to Alan. Okay, thank you. Those are all um, very good questions. I mean, I think in, in developing um, countries, um, I mean, there is some evidence, you know, notably, I think from Latin America that which have economies with very high levels of informality that actually the minimum wage in the formal sector actually applies also has some influence on what happens in, in, in the informal sector. So you see in some informal workers being paid the minimum wage, even though you might think, well, given they're informal, you know, you're breaking some rules, why not laws, why not break this one as well? Um, but having said that, I do think, um, you know, as I said earlier, I don't think it's a good idea to, um, you know, have minimum wages that you're not really uh, enforcing uh, very, um, very much. And I think many developing countries, um, that is an important issue. I mean, of course, the state, you know, there's less state capability, government capability in a whole range of issues, not just the, the minimum wage. But and I think, but I think I, I, I would be cautious about using um it in you in quite a lot of uh, developing countries in terms of regional uh, minimum wages i mean the you know i think it depends on the extent of regional wage differentials in a country i think in the uk um on balance you know i'm i'm against it um you know what you might have will be a higher minimum wage in london you then get sort of issues around well where is the edge of london 
um, and those sort of border issues that are a bit difficult. But, you know, countries like the US have quite a lot of regional variation in the minimum wage because it's devolved to states and different states choose different minimum wages and that sort of fine as, uh, as well. So I, it's not something actually I have very, very strong um, you know, views on. In terms of the impact of the minimum wage on second jobs, that's a really good question. I have no idea what the answer to that is. I don't think the fraction of people with second jobs in the UK has changed very much over, but that's just at the aggregate level, whether there's any impact of the minimum wage, I'm afraid I just don't know. Okay, very good. Uh, thanks. That answers also. So the previous answer, a question by Dimitris Korpakis about whether a, a differentiated minimum wage policy geographically would, would help also uh, revitalize less developed regions. And uh, as we heard, Alan, uh, not very much support on, on a regionally differentiated minimum um, uh, wage. Um, there's another question by John Bass Bassadin uh, saying that tourist economies su such as Greece and other countries in Southern Europe seem to be subject to pressure from other cheap locations outside the Eurozone, uh, such as Turkey, Tunisia, Morocco. So you have the, the pressure of the fixed currency uh, as well as um, you know, the, the kind of cost competition. Um, and of, although we're thinking about sort of, you know, a lot of, of, of where uh, minimum wage work is located is in non-tradables, actually, you know, hospitality and tourism that we consider, you know, non-tradable is actually the, the, the main export uh, of Greece. So uh, can, you, can you link, uh, can we link a bit to the, to the issue of external competitiveness, the minimum wage in relation to external competitiveness? Who would like to speak on that? Uh, and Alan, you're welcome uh, to start. Um, well, I'll just say very briefly, I, I think it is a relevant you know, consideration, um, you know, that if, for ex you know, if you have a minimum wage, there is evidence that, you know, when you raise the minimum wage, you raise the prices of the services that, you know, those minimum wage workers were, were producing. And, you know, in the UK, you're also raising the income of the locals who would go out to eat in the restaurants that may be, you know, that sort of works more or less, but in a country like Greece, um, you know, where that is a tradable sector, much more so than in the UK. I think that is a consideration you would want to look at. Um, Manoli? Um, so I, I think overall this, this, is, this is certainly a concern, um, but if you, you know, increase the costs of, uh, of production, you might, you might reduce competitiveness. Um, I just want to uh, remark that, um, that this is just one of many, many things that, uh, that affect a country's uh, competitiveness. And again, I want to refer to Greece's uh, experience in the 2000s and the 2010s. In the 2000s, where you had all these uh, very high minimum wages, nevertheless, uh, Greek exports, uh, manufacturing exports uh, actually, grew at an extremely fast rate. Um, it was the fastest in, in the Eurozone actually, um, faster than Germany, for example, um, which is surprising, uh, you know. Um, and, and I think that had to do with, um, you know, obviously with other factors, but labor costs did not seem to have, a, you know, such, such a strong, uh, such a big problem. And in the 2010s, the opposite happened, sort of wages dropped very much, but exports didn't. Uh, I think in both cases, sort of financing was more important in exploring, you know, competitiveness. So, so I, wouldn't, I wouldn't take competitiveness as being sort of the, the primary issue for deciding whether to increase minimum wages or not. I think there's other issues more important, such as, you know, having an inclusive labor market, like I mentioned before. Mm. All right, uh, thanks. Uh, I would like to go to another question by Karen Mumford, uh, which is addressed to Professor Manning, but I would like to start by asking Antigone her, her view on that. Uh, what do you think the minimum wage has done for female pay relative to male and the relative female employment opportunities? Because I know Antigone, you've done work, of course, on gender employment issues. Hey, thank you for the for the question. I'll I'll try to address it quickly. Um, uh, Greece is infamous for its very low uh, female labor force participation and for its very high um, uh, women's unemployment rate. Also, it is very uh, well known that uh, uh, when asking people who are not seeking for a job, who are outside of the labor market, why are you not looking for a job? Uh, a, a, a percentage around 45% said, I don't, I'm not looking for a job because I 
have other things, other commitments at home. And only 3% said, I'm not looking for a job because I'm discouraged because there are no jobs out there or because the, uh, the, the pay is low. It seems to me that during the crisis, women um, moved very um, uh, decisively uh, into the labor market as uh, first uh, uh, job seekers and also as unemployed until they found a job. And this was reflected in a very clear um, shift in family budgets whereby women's contribution increased and uh, men's contributions contribution declined taking into account that the whole budget declined also because of the crisis, but it sort of uh, redressed some, 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 some um, semblance of a balance. I think that the most important thing for women is uh, the opportunity, job openings, I mean, to, uh, a, 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 an economy that creates jobs. Secondly, some flexibility regarding times and um, um, comings and goings, I mean, in order, to find ways to combine things before they manage to convince their partner to take on part of the uh, burden. And also uh, the, the capacity to, 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 to get into trainings that will improve their career prospects. Lack of career prospects is uh, killing many um, women who started um, working aspiring to a better future, but in the end did not work. So one has to Thanks. find solutions for caring, but also careers for women. Thanks, Antigone. Alan, do we have evidence on the gender effects of minimum wages? Yes, we, I mean, we do. Um, so, I mean, it's reduced the gender pay gap, the, the rise in the minimum wage, because women are more likely to be low paid by probably a few percentage points. It's not, um, you know, it's not the, I shouldn't exaggerate the effect because the gender pay gap exists at all points in the pay distribution, not just at the bottom. Um, and I also, I think people have looked specifically at the effects on, on female employment. And again, you know, female employment rates in the UK were, you know, very, very high. So I think the evidence there is that, um, you know, it hasn't really, doesn't seem to have harmed um, employment opportunities for women while raising their wages a bit. So thanks, Alan. We're running out of time. There are a couple of questions that have been addressed one way or another in the presentation. So, for example, Luis Christopher is asking, what's the experience of spillovers of the minimum wage uh, in the rest of the economy? And I think, Alan, you mentioned in the presentation, very little spillovers, uh, um, at least in the UK experience. I would like to close by asking a question that I mentioned in the in the beginning about the European minimum uh, wage. Uh, Paula Mateus from Nova University in, in Lisbon is asking, uh, is Professor Manning in favour of the European minimum wage? Why? Um, I, I, to be honest, I'm not a big fan of that. I mean, maybe I'm British and so that, I mean, I think individual countries should have um, their own minimum wages, but I think it's probably a matter for uh, the individual countries more than an appropriate matter for uh, the EU as a whole. I mean, it should be said that some of the countries which have the lowest level of wage inequality have got there through having no minimum, formal minimum wage, rather than having very extensive collective bargaining. And it seems to me that I wouldn't really want to, you know, destroy that system that seems to be working well in order to have a common institutional framework across the EU. But maybe that's a British perspective on these things. It's very much a Danish perspective as well, <laughs> Alan. So, <laughs> uh, well said. Okay, uh, I'm afraid we have to stop here. Um, uh, before I thank uh, our, our speakers, just to say that uh, I want to uh, thank, of course, the National Bank of Greece and the uh, Hellenic Alumni Association of LSC uh, for helping organize and supporting this event. The video of this event will be, and the PowerPoint presentation will be available on the uh, website of the Hellenic Observatory and also available on the um, on our YouTube uh, uh, channel. Uh, we do not have any more events for this uh, calendar year, so join us again in 2022 at the events of the Hellenic Observatory. Uh, until then, many wishes for the festive uh, season. 
In closing, let me thank very much our uh, keynote speaker, Alan Manning, and our, the discussions of the Gonic Liberaki and Manolis Galdarinos for the very insightful comments and the discussion. Thank you very much, and Happy New Year to all.